really excited to have these three people here. When I first saw this documentary, I just knew I wanted to bring it to San Francisco. And so who I'd like to bring on is actually, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him, is fashion designer Kevin Hall. He's all the way here from LA, he's gonna moderate it. Now he has dressed Michelle Obama, and actually has been honored by Michelle Obama. Um, he's also dressed Charlize Theron, Selma Hayek. He's also dressed Katherine Heigl and Anne Hathaway. So please put your hands together and let's invite Kevin Hall. Yeah. Have a seat. Now also I would like to bring out the fabulous supermodel Pat Cleveland. And lastly, I would like to bring out fashion designer Stephen Burroughs, who came here all the way from New York City. We have New York royalty in the house. But lastly, I do have something that I like to share with Pat and Stephen, is that the mayor's office, our London Breed, our new mayor, and also Malia Cohen from the Board of Supervisors, have a certificate honor to honoring you, Pat and Stephen, for service to our community in San Francisco from the city and county of San Francisco. Here you go. Thank you. So let's give a big round of applause to them. Thank you. Well, bonjour, San Francisco. <laughs> How did you guys enjoy the film? Yes, amazing, right? Well, I am so happy to be here with Steven and with Pat. Um, I have to tell you guys, I didn't share this with you before, but you know, at 16, there I am in Detroit, Michigan, looking through my W magazines. That was when they had the large format of the W magazine. Seeing the two of you and just wanting to be in that world, wanting to be in fashion. So I just have to say thank you for inspiring me for decades. I, I love you guys. It's so great to be here with you. Thank you. And Pat, I'm also thinking of one specific look. Um, when you were also working for Halston, the red cat suit, red cashmere shawl, red satin boots, killer. <laughs> down to earth red. Yeah, down to earth red. Devil made me do it. <laughs> But I want to hear a little bit about how you guys met. You know, you've known each other for a long time. Went to Versailles together and that whole and that whole incredible trip. But where did the relationship start, uh, Stephen? I have Henry Bendel um, uh -huh. in 1970 when Vogue uh, magazine was shooting my first collection for Bendel's uh, when I started there. So at Bindles, um, there was a woman named Geraldine Stutz. And Geraldine was the woman that, um, she really invented the shop in shop kind of concept where designers could have their own shops. And I hear there was a, a, a secret or a, a magic mirror or some kind of great mirror that she had. Yeah, there. she had a three-way mirror, three-sided <laughs> mirror that she would try on samples. And that's how she selected what would go in the store. Right. And she called, I had a meeting with her and I took a few of my samples and uh, she tried them on and twirled around in front of that mirror and turned around and said, I'll give you a boutique on the third floor, when can you start? Wow, wow. amazing, amazing. So, um, you know, when I'm thinking about retailers and that kind of thing, we don't really have retailers <laughs> now that will believe in a designer, that will back the designer, put the money behind him. Everything is so instant, instant, instant. Mm. I mean, that was a wonderful and incredible opportunity for you. When you were uh, working with Bindles, um, is that when you had a chance to work, you know, have the atelier and work within the store? And, and how did your shop in shop look? Uh, well, she let me design the shop and it was black with nail heads. Mm. Yeah. Um, and mirrors. Yeah. The whole back wall was a mirror, and behind it was the dressing room. And it was put on the third floor. 
in the fashion department right across from Sonia Ricciel, which was doing a big business at Fendel's at the time. It was like the, the highest grossing shop in, in the store. Wow, amazing. So Pat, you're living in New Jersey. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> they always talk about New Jersey movies, but it's We're really, really nice, Jersey. yeah. <laughs> we go and we do things in Newark, we do things all the time for yeah. students, and yeah. there's a lot going on, a lot of famous people. People come from there, Frank Sinatra, what's okay, her, okay. everybody, okay. you know, they, it's right across from New York. So what's happening with the peacocks? I hear you, you raise peacocks, I have baby peacocks, I have two <laughs> peacocks, they come in the kitchen and eat the dog food, and when I'm painting, they're like sitting around, and they're, oh, here I am, don't try to get my attention. They walk in the house to get the food. <laughs> he comes over, he sees some peacocks. Let's talk a little bit about what was going on in the film. So, Stephen, they came to you. Did they call you? I mean, this was in 73. Was there a telegram? I mean, how did you get the, the, the call for the, uh, you know, for the, for the well, film? Well, the woman who uh, came up with the idea for the uh, Versailles event was Eleanor Lambert. Right. And she was my publicist when I went to 7th Avenue after Bendel's. Right. Um, and she called me and asked me if I'd like to be involved in the show. And I said yes. Yeah. And what was the, what kind of went through your head in terms of, because they were Blass and Oscar and Halston and all these designers that, you know, had been at it for a while. Were you a little bit nervous? Were you apprehensive? Or No, I just was going to do what I do. Yeah. And yeah. make it colorful, make it sexy. Right. And that was my, it was all about a train that got longer and longer. Yes. And until Pat came out with the longest train at the end. <laughs> so Pat, all the designers, of course, they wanted to work with you. You've worked with, tell us some of the designers you've worked with up to that point. A to Z? Oh my God, <laughs> I had the whole 7th Avenue gang. I had Bill and Steven, Oscar and Ke uh, Calvin. There was Halston and Givenchy and everybody American, exactly. Right. Ann Klein, um, you know, Karen... Uh, you know, she was with Ann Klein. Right. Um, oh my God, there's so many, I can't even think of. <laughs> A to Z. A to Z designers. So you um, decided you were going to go to Paris. You guys were on the plane. I hear there was lots of great things going on the plane. Paint a picture for me. Well, I we saw some in the film. You know, I was that in Paris. Had drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in Paris, and they called me back, and I heard that Liza was going to do it, and we were going to be showgirls, and we all wanted to be showgirls, all the 7th Avenue girls, because we never had a chance to show off in the magazines or anything. We were sort of like shoved to the back. And at that time, it was like either you could do show or you had to do pictures and I was doing both and I just wanted to be with my walking girls because we knew how to move it and then Stephen had all the girls that everybody wanted because we were like moving the clothes around like oh flagpoles with a flag behind us <laughs> and um, we were just gonna march it over there and we had Kay Thompson she right. was like directing Liza Minnelli and Judy Garland she's the woman who does the hands like this bonjour Paris which was the song we had to learn to dance to because I was third row backup girl to Liza Minnelli <laughs> and we had to practice in front of those mirrors and we thought we were all that and we were like the Americans and we said da 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 and we were going to go over and take over <laughs> we decided on the airplane I mean an airplane full of crazy designers and models and at that time, you could do anything you wanted in the airplane, like yeah. party. <laughs> and not one person was sitting in their own seat. The boys had their shirts off. We were like on holiday. <laughs> do you remember the that? The designers sat in the front. Oh, oh. yeah. The designers were right, yeah. They were civilized. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't sound like they were civilized when it was time for rehearsal. What, ha I mean, and Stephen, you, you were there, and you didn't get involved in all the foolishness. How did you, how did you stay out of it? Well, after you rehearsed and then you went back to pa to Paris because there was no heat there <laughs> in in the palace. It was freezing cold. Yeah. I don't know how the girls did it. They had to stay there all day. But we would go back and um, I was second after Bill Glass. Mm -hmm. um, so I missed out on the fight between Anne Klein Halston and Oscar De Laurentiis. <laughs> 
couture than That was a couture fight. <laughs> <laughs> so I missed it. I wish I had been there to see it because yes. I heard it was a humdinger. Well, tell us a little bit about that. Well, well I, I was there. Details. And what, was, what was Halston's yeah, thing about? Thing. First of all, we were freezing to death in the back, and there, of course, you know, there was no toilet paper and no food. And, you know, we were just waiting in that old building with the roof leaking and no heating. And, you know, it's not so glamorous backstage, really at Versailles, uh, you know, unless you, afterwards you could walk through the Hall of Mirrors, but I mean, they were going berserk. Everybody wanted to be first. It was like everybody lost their minds and they became children. No, it's my turn. <laughs> After waiting six hours for the French people to stop their rehearsals and then all the people who were supposed to help us and put the lighting up and the music went home. Mm. So we were stuck with an empty theater and no help. And then, what was it, Joe Eula had made a design? What Joe happened? Joe Eula, they measured in inches instead of meters and it came out too small. So we lost the scenery. The scenery which looked Which turned like out to be a good thing because it made it, all you could do was look at the clothes. Right. And the French side was too, two and a half hours long and the American side was 37 minutes and we killed them. <laughs> yes. So Pat, tell me a little bit about your, when you were wearing the chiffon dress. Oh, How, you know, you nobody spins like you. I mean, did you dance as a, a child, or where did this? No, I was spinning come I was from? born as a moth. <laughs> you was born as a moth. Yeah, and when I see the light, it's like, oh, it's God! I have to fly to the light. <laughs> oh, hello, God! Here I am. I have thirty layers of chiffon. Take me now. <laughs> Die on the stage, twirling. And I got to the edge of the stage, and I was twirling so much, I was like right on the edge, and everybody was like, oh, she's gonna fall. Off. Ha ha, I fooled you. I'm going back the other way. You know, it's like I didn't die on the stage. I was the moth who got away. And I had a great time because the spotlight was on me and I knew all of Paris was there. I had worked with every French designer, all my American friends were there. I had to do my best with the other girls, of course. And now your daughter Anna is also model. You've taught her. How did you train her? Twirling. <laughs> Just stay dizzy. Just twirl. Just keep, keep, keep spinning. Keep spinning. <laughs> so let me ask you this, Stephen. After you return from Paris, well, actually, both of you, I'll pose this to you. What changed in terms of your, your business, in terms of visibility? Did you see um, an uptick? Or was it kind of still on the down low? Because this wasn't really very publicized. It was on the down low because... Mm. The fashion press didn't cover it as a fashion event. They covered it as a society event because of all the society people that came. Mm -hmm. um, so women's wear at the time was the big fashion magazine uh, publisher. And they just ran a small story about it. And so it was not like the French accepted us the way they did. They were throwing their programs in the air and screaming. Yeah. Um, which made all the Americans feel really good. But that was at the end of the show. Those programs were really expensive. They were made out of gold leaf. Wow. And they were throwing them up in the air and stamping their feet and going crazy. Yay! And Grace Kelly was like throwing her tiara let's on the floor. About, let's talk and about the jewels Josephine in the house. Baker, who? The jewels that were in the house. There were the so many diamonds. And when you looked <laughs> out, you thought, oh my God. And you know, everybody couldn't come in there. That's why there was no press because all those royals were there, the Rothschilds. And I was sitting there next to the Duchess of Windsor. We were like chatting and elbowing each other and partying, drinking champagne. And then I was walking down the Hall of Mirrors with Givenchy and he's six foot seven. So it was like, oh, I'm in love. And, and Stephen had everybody dressed in feathered jackets and the, and the cherubs were dancing in the ceiling like these lights were candle lights and the, everything came to life and you felt like, oh my God, I'm floating on a cloud. It was so unreal. It was like being back in the 1700s. So amazing, amazing. And the beautiful Josephine Baker was there. I think she was at least 70 years old. Yeah. Right, Stephen? About seven. Yeah, like let's, let's hear a little bit about her, her look. And did you have a chance to meet her? Yeah, that was one of the highlights of the trip was to meet Josephine Baker. And she was backstage watching us do our rehearsal. And she came out and said, you all are going to be great. Yeah. 
amazing, amazing. She had the crazy horse girls all around her, <laughs> and she was standing there. And my girlfriend said, "Distract her, talk to her." And my girlfriend Billy Blair, she was in the back of Josephine Baker, picking the feathers off the back of her dress so she could have them to put in her notebook. <laughs> and I said, "Don't do it, Billy. Don't do it. Just keep talking to her." And she gave each one of us a feather. I still have it. <laughs> Terrible. You better watch out behind you. <laughs> so the Duchess of Windsor said that you stole Paris and Yves Saint Laurent. What did he say to you? He said you make beautiful clothes, but he said it in French. Yes. <laughs> he said you were the only American designer. Yes. He loved you the best. We yes. have been <laughs> I've been seeing Stephen's clothes for some years because I was like wearing Stephen ah, to Eve's yes. uh, atelier, and he already had known about you so much ahead of time. He admired your your design, so simple with the lettuce him, and no, yes, the construction was all in the all in the bias and so simple. Like you could put a hundred of his dresses in a carry on bag, <laughs> <laughs> whereas the other dresses were so bulky you would need like an ox cart to carry one dress. So Stephen, let's talk a little bit about that DNA. Um, inventing, let's tell the audience how you invented the or how you came up with that fabulous lettuce edge that became your signature, or one of your signatures. Well, it was a mistake uh. <laughs> that happened when one of the sample hands stretched the hem of a dress and it made it wave. And I fell in love with it and made them stretch it even more and that's how lettuce became. And what about the zigzag stitch? How did you kind of come up and what kind of colors did you use Well, when I was that? eight years old, I wanted to make a dress for my girlfriend who lived upstairs for her doll. And my grandmother had just gotten a Singer sewing machine, knew that zigzag was one of the stitches. I just fell in love with the zigzag stitch and used it on everything. Yeah. But I just made that one dress at the time. <laughs> because my grandmother was a sample hand at Hattie Carnegie. Wow. And she, I asked her to show me how to make a dress. So she did. And I just fell in love with this zigzag stitch and I put it on everything. everything. In red. In red. So red was like the thread that kind of pss, pulled it, it all together. Blood, the veins running through the life of the clothes. Ah. Which he called toys. Yes, yes. But lots of great color. You love color. Well, how, where did this come from, this love for color? My mother yeah. used to do coloring books that she would fill in very strongly with the color and I seem to have inherited it from her. Um, so I would make everything in color and throw different colors together and of course every, all colors were relative to me so it just made sense to put them together in any fashion that I felt comfortable with. So Pat. Um, Rainbow Man. <laughs> Rainbow, yeah. Modeling now has changed a lot. A little boring, um, I think. Not with my daughter. Not with your daughter, no, no. I'm just turning it out. She's slaying all over the world. Dragon slayer. Yeah, she's a dragon slayer. So she but, has personality. Yes. Which is what's missing and, in the and models today. Respect yeah. the artists for the designers. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that. When you work for a designer, I mean, what is your thought process? I mean, because you, you, it's like you take on a character, you take on the essence of the design, or you, you catch you catch the vision. I become the designer's dream because yes. in his head, I see such a beautiful things. Like designers are really hard workers, and they yes, make women look beautiful. <laughs> and I just feel like they make me, they look at me, and I'm just really, really plain. And they, they dress me up so I feel as good as I wish I could feel. And so I respect that, yeah. that they chose me, and then I trying to live up to their... And then you start spinning. <laughs> I start spinning like a spool or a bobbin. Well, Pat becomes like your every woman. You can just think of whatever you want to design and put it on her and you know it's going to be come alive. I respect it. 
unexpected because yeah. I wanted to do it myself. But then when I met Stephen, he was doing it so beautifully. I said, forget it. He's so perfect. I'll never be like that. So I'm going to wear those clothes. And he took me on and he dressed me up and he put me, he put me in society. He yeah. brought me to parties. He introduced me to his friends. He introduced me to Hall, St. Giorgio, other designers that were his contemporary. He introduced me to Joe Yule. He introduced me to everybody. He gave me Well, I thought you should work for all of them. Yeah, he was like, and they were all best friends. Yeah. They were all friends. It was like a wonderful design it was community. was a family. Like in the 70s, there was yeah. a tightness, like a family. Yeah, we shared. Although we never sat around and discussed what was going to be next. No. We right. never had that conversation. Right. But they did wear each other's clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they, like Halston would wear his belts or, you know, somebody would wear something of Steve, you know, yeah, they would yeah. wear a piece of each other's So where'd you all, all kind of hang out at? Studio 54? What, were you, what was all this happening at? Halston's Boutique. Okay. Or okay. Halston's Atelier on 68th Street in Madison. Right. Studio 54. Okay, so my, my again, back to that, <coughs> collecting those W's. I have a vision, speaking of Halston. Um, that fabulous gray, charcoal gray townhouse. Mm. Those steps that were floating, the That's floating steps. Now. And Pat, were you in the skimp dress on those steps? I tell you, those are killer steps when they don't have a railing. <laughs> killer <laughs> steps, yes. But when you have your platform shoes off and you're trying to prove a point that anybody can work those stairs, you just dance on them. And then you bring, you say, these ch these stairs are not a challenge to me. <laughs> and, you, and you know, the gray carpeting, and he had orchids growing all over the place. Was it was a, like a I jungle. Yeah, orchids. they would be changed by Tony. Was Tony the orchid man? <laughs> the orchid man. Man from Henry Bindel's would change them in him for Stephen too. They were all growing orchids and had Rego candles. There, you have to get that candle. Rego candle. The yes. Rego candle is the candle <laughs> of Diana Vreeland, Halston, and Stephen Burroughs, and every designer in the world has Must that candle. The cypress scent. Yes, the cypress scent will take you there. Yes, it will. <laughs> Also cover up everything else, but anyway, <laughs> don't blow smoke into the hallway. <laughs> but back to reality, I'm telling you, the the things that were so charming is everyone's home was so much their character. Mm. Stephen had colors and paintings that he did. Do you remember that big painting you did? And everything was symbolic of something sexual and it was beautiful and <laughs> there was no fear and there was no AIDS and everybody was like unisex at one point or, you know, everybody wore each other's clothes. I wore Stephen's, uh, uh, everything he had, like we'd go to Fire Island and we'd go to Halston's house and it was like, throw on these clothes. And then he'd have none left for himself. I'd have on his pants and every. And Halston, and Halston would open his closet and, oh, look at my clothes. It was everything cashmere, the same outfit. I said, why do you have all the same clothes so I can get out to go to work early? It's a uniform. <laughs> he says, but I'm putting on the red socks for you today. And, <laughs> you know, it was just a simple. They all had a way to dress. Right. Everybody had their signature. Their type of signature, signature look. way, and they loved each other. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> so career highlights. Let's talk a bit about career highlights. Would you say that Versailles was a career highlight? Uh, well, I, I'm sure it had to be. Yes, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Highlight? The lights were all candlelit, and the guys <laughs> were standing around with white gloves, and, you know, the costumes, and it was just too much. Yeah. It was too much to think about. Opulence and decadence and fabulous. It was just Paris couture. Like, I feel if the bustles came into the room, we girls from 7th Avenue had the natural bustle. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what made the show boom shakalaka boom. <laughs> when we got to the end of the runway, we were like boom, bang, boom. Bang. We were like showing off but our that moves. Was, that would be like the original voguing, no? We did yeah. the original voguing. Sorry, Madonna. <laughs> Stephen, didn't you teach us that? He said, now get out there and pose. And we were like, mm, honey. We were like, OK, nobody's going to pose better than us. Posing is the whole trick Posing to close. <laughs> Finding that spot and hitting it, right? That's the spot you got to hit. <laughs> hitting the spot. 
<laughs> so Pat, you have to tell the audience some of your beauty secrets. We have to know. I mean, uh, yeah. you have, I mean, you look amazing, amazing, amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. the point is that one time I went to the uh, Museum of Art, the big museum, you know, where Diana Vreeland was at the time. And she said, the Met, the Met right? That's the one. And we went to the Met. And I had lunch with Gloria Swanson. And she came in and she had this little suit on and me and Dinah really and Gloria Swanson were sitting in the room having some cucumber sandwiches. And I looked at her and I said, her skin was so perfect. I said, what do you do? She said, I'm a vegetarian. I stopped eating meat that day. I would not touch a sausage. I said, that's it. And she didn't let people know, but she had a guru and she stood on her head. And I didn't know that Mrs. Freeland had a guru. Muktananda. She was really into meditation. So I closed my eyes and I started imagining fabulous stuff and that kept me alive and I still meditate. And I'm still like That's going vegan. It helps. Boil it down with some coconut oil and you'll be fine. As long as you don't have to climb the tree to get it. The tree. Back to reality, fashion. <laughs> that keeps you alive too. You alive. Yeah, fashion will keep you alive. <laughs>